morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Um, uh, are we recording here as well, or is it just live streaming? There we go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, welcome to the second uh, episode of No Code Data and AI. Um, I'm really excited today because I just came from the Full Stack Deep Learning's Large Language Model Bootcamp out in California, in San Francisco, and learned a great, great deal, met a lot of people. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what, um, what I learned there, but that's, I think, going to be a different subject matter altogether. Uh, today, uh, we're going to focus on you know, how does one become a prompt engineer um, with whatever skill you bring to the table, and you'll be surprised that that anybody can get started. Uh, in the last talk, I covered different tools that are available for non-technical people to not only use GPT, chat GPT, to ask it to do things, but also there are uh, you know, no-code methods of doing things. There are apps that are built on top of chat GPT that can automate some of your workflow. Uh, but today we're going to talk about the, the core skill in, uh, in this large language model landscape which is how do you ask uh, questions? Now, prompt engineering doesn't just apply to ChatGPT or the text-based generative AI. It actually also applies to things like Mid Journey or Stable Diffusion or DALI. And these are text-to-image generators, and they have their own style. Um, but everything I'm talking about today, you could kind of apply it. Uh, although, you know, my, my focus here is uh, on the large language models specifically for text generation, text generative AI. So um, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, although I will walk through everything uh, that's on here in a way that uh, will make sense if you're just listening to this episode uh, later on as a podcast. All right. And Akwe, if you just give me a verbal nod, uh, if it's showing up okay. Sure, not perfectly. Okay, great. So, you know, uh, LM, large language model, uh, is for most people synonymous with GPT because that was the most, that is the most famous one that people are aware of that's in the media. Uh, but prompt engineering, as I said, it's not just for generative AI, it's for image generation, audio generation, or whatever else will come out. Uh, but Prompt, gen prompt engineering is, is, is also uh, applicable to many different types of large language models that are out there. There are, and I'll, I'll show kind of a peek to what, what, um, what to expect, you know, in terms of what other companies are coming out with large language models, what are some of the open source ones that are coming out. Um, but it's not just for GPT. If you, if you get this skill, this skill is going to be useful for, uh, for whatever industry you go into, uh, whatever use case you can think of. So, you know, uh, prompt engineering LMs like GPT 3.5, which is the one that people use on the free version of ChatGPT, or GPT 4, which is on the paid version uh, for some people. Um, there are other ones like Cohere. Uh, Cohere has been out for a while. It's one of the first ones that I knew that were other than uh, OpenAI's text generation model. Claude is made by Anthropic. Um, it's the one that's used in Poe. You can try it out, but you can also now use Claude in your own APIs. Um, Stable LM is an open source one uh, that has uh, been released by Stability. These are the folks who have open sourced a stable diffusion image to, uh, sorry, text to image generator. Um, and that one is good for use in commercial purposes. Uh, all of these uh, have their own characteristics, their own qualities, um, their strengths and their weaknesses. Um, but, you know, talking to them, prompt engineering is about talking to these models and it's like casting spells. It's like casting magic spells. And it's really more art than engineering. It's understanding what the goal is and being able to break down that into some text, uh, into, into the English language. Um, if you're, if you're you know, using English, although I think some of them can do other languages as well. And basically, you know, getting this outcome based on what you just type in in English. Now, that's the basis of prompt engineering. And there are tips and tricks that people have come up with 
there's not necessarily like the book on prompt engineering. And that's why I, I put this deck together and I put a blog post together because I think people need a guide for what to expect, right? When they're, what are they getting into? And today I'm gonna to talk about the 12 levels of large language model prompt engineering that, um, that I have kind of stratified. And I think that it's just gonna get deeper and deeper. But I think between level one and level 12, um, it's a good survey of what people are already doing with, with large language models today. Just a shameless plug, um, I work for a company in Ant, and we have tons of amazing customers, global brands that we help with their data platforms and uh, hope to soon help with some of their large language modeling, uh, uh, not necessarily just prompt engineering, but maybe help them make their own large language models at some point. Uh, I've skipped ahead um, in the series. Uh, the first talk was, or first set of talks was really on uh, no code data and AI and why it's so important that this convergence is allowing people to use AI that normally would not have been able to use uh, before. And today I'm going to go into a different section of the series, which is, um, you know, really the automation, because prompt engineering is a way to get the machine, get ChatGPT or whatever LM to give you an answer, uh, but that's just a stepping stone to really automating it to, to do work for you. So there's essentially six sections. So one, section one, I would say levels one and two, it's everybody has access to what you can do by being a level one and level, level two uh, prompt engineer. Um, levels three and four are, for folks that are comfortable with no code systems, app builders, automation tools, um, and, and how to use that to automate uh, uh, or create apps or to, uh, to automate a workflow. Um, levels five and six are for folks that are either comfortable with programming already or want to learn. Um, and, and, and going one step beyond what no code is able to do gives you a lot more speed. <clears throat> Level seven and eight are folks that have a background in software engineering, which I know is a lot of people. I've been in the industry for a while. There's lots of people that can uh, upskill their software engineering skills with some prompt engineering and, and do amazing things with it. In fact, most apps that are built on top of the, the LLM APIs are basic software engineering. There's really no special sauce beyond that. It's really just that. Uh, levels nine and 10, uh, require some background in data engineering, not necessarily, you, you don't have to be a data scientist or, 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 or uh, somebody with a background in, you know, training and, and, and using uh, ML models. Uh, it's basic data engineering because we're really using our own data, bringing it in somewhere, and then using that data for, uh, to be a part of a prompt. And then finally, levels 11 and 12 are folks that have a background in machine learning, uh, are data scientists, and are thinking about either fine tuning an existing model that's out there with their data or to train their own, which by the way, uh, as, you'll, as you'll learn uh, near the end of talk, probably not worth it uh, because the ones that are out there are really, really good. So as I said, LLM level one and two, uh, I think is accessible to everybody. You really don't need to have any programming experience. Um, if you don't have a chat GPT account, you can make one. Um, you may need a credit card to get the paid version if you want to have more power. Um, and, and also, it's not just chat GPT. There are several tools uh, out there that are, uh, because there are so many different models that are coming out. So for example, Poe, uh, at Poe.com, P-O-E, like Edgar uh, Allan Poe, um, is freely available. Like you can install it on your phone. You can use it on the web. There's Bard, bard.google.com, which uh, is not that great, honestly, but it's you can just join the wait list on Google with your Gmail account and you'll get it uh, pretty quickly. And then there's Bing Chat, which has been out there now for a while. Uh, and then there are some sites like you.com, just you.com that have integrated ChatGPT and you can, you can talk to it. They have a chat function as well. So how do you get started? Well, you got to get an account, right? You got to start somewhere. It's not something that you can download necessarily just to your phone. You have to have an internet connection. Um, and there are tons of different apps that are out there. 
Um, and I'll, you know, drop this in the, the show notes in the blog later, but there are sites that just categorize software built on top of GPT API, like for everything you can imagine. There's ones where you upload a PDF document and then you can talk to it. Um, and the same skill can be helpful, which is because it's ultimately using one of these large language models, the way you prompt, the way you ask questions is the core skill that you need. And once you start using one that you like, I think the easiest one to get started with, the most powerful one to get started with is ChatGPT. Um, you can you can take a look at Poe because Poe allows you to switch between ChatGPT, Claude, and, and a few other ones. Um, you just need to start experimenting. And, and honestly, it's not about uh, right or wrong, although you can go find play, you know, just uh, chat GPT, prompt engineering hacks. There's, there's tons of sites out there, uh, but just getting used to having a conversation with a chatbot alone is a good skill. Uh, I just came on, came off of another uh, webinar where I heard that it's like building a relationship. And as you talk to these tools, um, it remembers at least some part of the conversation so the more you talk to it in that particular thread, the better your output is going to be. And if you really want to get, you know, dig deeper, um, there are, um, you know, there is documentation on how to get what you want. There's uh, tons of websites out there, uh, but this is the easiest one to get started. Just getting on a chat GPT and trying it out or getting on the PO and trying it out and seeing what happens. What I will say is don't just put in a search query right? It is as good as the input that you give it. It is as good as the question that you ask it. If you have very specific questions, it has specific answers. And the more domain knowledge you have, the better it is. So, you know, uh, for one example, if you are trying to use it for um, market research to, to make it go faster, if you say things like, in this particular region of the world, this particular type of company with this demographic and this uh, you know, budget, um, what, what are the type of problems that they face in technology, for example, right? Because you gave it that context, because you gave it much more information, it, it, it doesn't read your mind, right? You have to kind of talk to it, just like you'd have to talk to a human being. Um, so if you are getting started, just start and start playing with it and see what it gives you. Um, there are plugins that are available like AI PRM uh, that has about 2,500 prompts. So you can see what they are uh, doing. Um, and then <clears throat> ChatGPT itself, if you pay for it, it has a plugin ecosystem where it not only uses the core lang language model, it can also talk to other systems out there. And you don't have to do any programming because those plugins are already there. Getting deeper into prompt engineering is going beyond being comfortable with the actual tool and starting to see what are the resources that are that are out there. So share GPT, uh, Poe allows people to share their prompts. GitHub, there's places where you can look for like awesome dash chat GPT and people have put their prompts out there. You can just you know see what what people are doing. Um, and, and ultimately you're really learning to experiment with you know your context and your instructions. Context being information that you feel that the large language model is, is uh, going to find useful. And then instructions. What is it exactly that you are trying to get from the large language model? Um, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, as I said earlier, it's like casting magic spells. But there's some you know tips and tricks that are, are, are really useful for everybody. So, for example, there's a uh, and there's actually academic papers out there. It's called Chain of Thought where normally people thought that if you give a large language model examples of what you're looking for, and then you ask it what to do, it's gonna give you a pretty good answer. It turns out that if you just give it the context and the instructions and just put, let's do this step-by-step step at the end of your prompt, it actually starts to break it down internally step-by-step step, and it comes out with a much more accurate answer than you would have gotten if you just said, hey, I need this, right? Um, and, and there are other kind of patterns, but ultimately it just comes down to what is the context and what is the instruction. Uh, there are tons of Discord groups out there, um, people that are focusing on learning how to use ChatGPT, people that are learning how to use different frameworks around GPT API. Uh, but you know, when you're part of a community of people that are asking questions, 
uh, and learning from each other, you're going to find something that somebody else has already encountered, right? So it's it's un unlikely that you're facing something that's a very terminally unique question that you're trying to get answered. And really, the the easiest way to see if your prompts are good is if you share it on a place like Share GPT, or if you're just sharing it with people in your own Slack or your own internal wiki, and people say, yeah, this is useful, right? Um, there's a couple of tools that I've been using to just catalog my prompts. Uh, well, I like Notion, Notion is a good tool, uh, but there are tools specifically for creating prompts and then sharing them. Uh, one is called Every Prompt, uh, another one is called uh, Promptable. And then I learned about one last week. It's called Brancher. Brancher goes one step beyond that. It not only allows you to take the prompt that you're making and share it with somebody, it allows you to chain different prompts together. And it's it does more than just text. It can do audio and it can do images as well. So it's worth looking into. Are LMs only at English at this point? Only scrubbing data on English. Um, Yes, so most of the LLMs, they they do focus on primarily English. Now there's LLMs that can do some translations because it's in the context of English. Um, there are some uh, LLMs that have been trained on Chinese text as well, which is another 40% of the all human languages. Um, and you know, there's actually data sets that people have prepared so that one doesn't have to go crawl the internet on their own. Um, and that's kind of a starting point. And for the most part, it, it's 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 useful for, for for work at least. It's pretty useful. Levels three and four are where you take your skill of prompt engineering and uh, you start to use no code tools. And if you have previous programming or coding experience, it helps because you then understand how to do things step by step. Um, I recommend this to everybody. You know, before you write any code, before you make any app with no code tools, draw it out. Draw out the flow of what you're trying to do. Uh, draw out the, the user interface, and that, that just helps you do it better. Um, and then give yourself time to understand the actual tools. Each no code platform is different, right? Bubble is different from something like Webflow, uh, which is different than something like Flutter. Uh, Make is different from Z Z Zapier, I think that's how it's pronounced, or Trade.io. There's lots of different tools in available in the no-code world that basically allow you to create user interfaces and then connect them to APIs. And that API connectivity is what allows you to use the uh, LLMs and, and to also use your prompt engineering skills there. Um, and the same thing with these automation tools like Make and Zapier, they're all based on APIs, right? And they have a connectivity to, at least I've looked at OpenAI and some of them may have connectivity to the other LLMs out there. So when we think about you know, making an app level three, um, it's not necessarily doing a, a sequence of events, which I would call a workflow and that's the next thing. Um, it's really just using the API to help you create information that is then used by other people or giving them some interactivity. For example, you could build your own chatbot, which allows the user to ask questions. And then because of your prompts, it creates something of value and it saves it in a database and then it gives it back to the user. And, you know, a lot of the tools like Jasper, Writer, you know, uh, copy.ai, which are just content creation tools. They are basically some variation of, of, I mean, I wouldn't say it's a no code app, but it's just some variation of an app that takes user input, wraps it with your prompt, gets something back, and then gives it back to the user. Um, I would say Bubble is a good one to start with um, from an app building perspective. I recently got into it. I've used some other ones out there. It's the first one that I would say allowed me to quickly make something and also give it to regular users. Uh, the other ones are either too design focused, they need me to do a Figma design uh, or whatever, or other ones were just not great for end users. They were just for like internal use, admin tools. Uh, Bubble was really good one. Retool is one of those things that is really for admin use or internal tools, and you can still use it. I just think that if you want to give it to other people, you should take a look at Bubble. Um, in terms of a database, you don't have to use a 
real database, you know, all of these no code apps uh, platforms, they work with like Airtable or Google Sheets, which is probably sufficient for, you know, getting started. Um, I do a lot of the automations in no code with just Airtable and Make. Uh, and even going beyond that, uh, if I wanted to use programming language, I would still use Airtable because it just works. <clears throat> if you, uh, you want to do this with no code, you need to learn two things. One is the app builder that you're going to use, and the other is the, quote, database that you're going to use. Um, Airtable has its own set of automations built in, its own nuances. A bubble has its own nuances, and when you connect the two through the um, Airtable plugin, some things work, some things don't. Um, and then, you know, each system has their own way of integrating to outside systems. So if it's a Make, Make has already existing plugins to OpenAI, although you can connect your own if you wanted to. Bubble has an existing ecosystem. There's probably plugins that already work with OpenAI that you can just add to your app, but you can also just directly call OpenAI. So you need to really learn the no-code app uh, builder or the no-code work, you know, automation tool um, and get comfortable with it. Otherwise, your front engineering skills will have to wait because you're just going to get stuck in building the app out. Um, and, and just remember, don't reinvent the wheel. There's lots of, whatever platform you use, people have done something already. So take a look at the plugins first um, and then get started from there. How I distinguish you know, a workflows versus just creating an app is in a workflow, uh, it goes one level beyond that where users may put something, something happens in the background, another user may add some input, something happens in the background, and eventually the end output is it's a result of many different steps in a workflow, right? Um, and, and technically, you can automate different steps in the workflow without having any user input. Um, again, I come back to something like Make uh, or Zapier. Um, they already have integrations with so many different things out there. So for example, you can say, if an email comes into my inbox, use GPT to summarize it and send me another in, you know, email with summary as the prefix on the subject, right? That's something you can easily do with Make or Zapier because it's already built in. Um, if you want to do a, a workflow where you're having different users or different things act upon that information, then you definitely need to have a place where you store that information and not just through the Zapier or through the Make workflow. Because once it's done, it's gone, right? Um, so here's an example where uh, you know our team, we uh, wanted to create about a thousand blog posts and, you know, we worked with, let's say 10 different technologies. So we used a prompt to say for this technology and this particular, uh, you know, area of, let's say data engineering, use, you know, make a title of a blog post that would be appealing to users and it would create a page title. Now that's, that's just a starting point, right? Uh, it's not the blog post itself. And then the next step in the workflow would go through each one of them and actually create a outline or a blog post on that particular topic. Now, we're not going to just go ahead and publish that, you know, just say, oh, this looks good because there's lots of inaccuracies and you'll learn this from prompt engineering. Um, ChatGPT and these LLMs, they don't have access to the internet. They don't have access to anything beyond a certain date of the data that was trained on, right? So you have to go through that step of validating and doing some QA on that. Um, but what I just described is a very simple workflow. Uh, you, can, you can take any business process and you can approximate it with some forms in Airtable plus, or forms in Google Sheets, plus an automation that takes that information, does something with it, and saves it back. If you use automation tools to do workflows and app builders, then you have a powerful combination. You can have a really nice looking app for users. And in the background, again, using no code tools and prompt engineering, you can do magic behind the scenes. Um, as with anything, um, you know, continue learning about the tool you're using. Let's say Make uh, has lots of plugins. The more you know, the more you can do with it. Levels five and six is where we get into some programming. And um, again, if you haven't programmed before, it's okay. Previous knowledge is useful, uh, but 
you're going to have to take a little leap of faith. And, and, and what I mean by that is, even if you don't know how to program, because of ChatGPT, you can ask it to make programs for you. And it creates a starting point. Um, and in fact, I use a tool called GitHub Copilot, which is powered by GPT inside my Visual Studio code. And I describe what I'm trying to do, and it, it writes code. It's not working 100% first time, but it's it's pretty good. And if there's an error, I can copy and paste that into ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm having an error. Can you help me fix it? And it actually does. So even if you haven't programmed before, you can do this. I, I met a guy last week at the conference who had been a sound engineer, and he used ChatGPT to learn how to program, and now he's doing amazing things. So that's just in the last three, four months. So if he can do it, anybody that has a background uh, you know, in math, logic, I mean, really, just, just you can just give it a try, right? Um, it will be useful for you to know things like REST and HTTP. It's not a must, but it's it's a good start um, because that's how we work with programming languages uh, in, in other large language models. We don't host that large language model in our servers. We're calling an API, just like any other API that's available. And so the first thing that we would do is using a programming language that we like, so I would say the easiest to start are Python uh, or TypeScript slash JavaScript. They're kind of the same. Um, I would recommend that because that there's a lot of stuff already out there. Um, if you need to go pro level and have a system that's fast, that's when you can use Java, Scala, C Sharp. Again, there's nothing stopping you from using any language to use OpenAI's API or Cohere's API because it's just, it's an API call, right? So if you have a software engineering background, you've worked with APIs. This is no different than that. All you're really doing is bringing the skill of prompt engineering to that knowledge. You got to experiment with your code. Uh, GPT has lots of resources in their docs, but uh, because there are different models you can use, there's different algorithms that they have, some that are faster and cheaper, some that are slower and more expensive, but they have better output. Um, and then just as I mentioned earlier, use ChatGPT itself to guide you. If you have any questions, if, you're break, if, you're, if your code isn't working, you can ask it. As I mentioned earlier, automation for workflows is going beyond just like creating an API or creating an app. It's sequencing different steps between users or different steps of a workflow. Um, you know, I, I've done workflows with Python and with Make, which is the no-code tool. I've gotten basically the same result. The only difference was that in Python, it was much faster. And when I switched to Python, I didn't necessarily have to switch to a real database like Postgres or Cassandra or MySQL. I just continued using Airtable because the scale of the data wasn't that big. And I used GPT to help me understand how to use the Airtable API. And once I got the hang of it, it was pretty easy. Level seven and eight um, are where you can really take your core skill of software engineering and go beyond making simple APIs or workflows. This is where uh, you're going to learn how to connect to your own data. Um, you're going to learn how to make APIs that are using different tools in the tool chain. Um, and, and because you have experience, let's say if you're a full stack developer, you can create the UI, the API, you can connect to databases, uh, it's good for you to know a little bit about design patterns. Uh, you should be able to, you know, uh, maybe debug if something isn't working out. Um, but, you know, if you're in the tech industry right now and you're a software developer, you already have the skills to get to level seven and eight, as long as you have grasped the core of prompt engineering. In level seven, uh, I would say the tools to start with um, are Llama Index and Langchain and Python, or Window AI and Langchain JS with TypeScript and JavaScript. And there's tons of examples that are out there. Um, there's tons of code that you can just download um, and, and, and run. Or if you're like me, I don't download the code. I just open it up in my Git pod. Uh, I love Git pod, um, where I just open the repo in Git pod, or I clone it. And everything's just kind of happening in the browser. And in a subsequent uh, you know, workshop, maybe I'll, I'll show uh, what I do there. 
but you, you don't have to have this stuff running on your computer. You can just do it 100% in the browser, right? Um, and then with Langchain uh, and <clears throat> in Llama Index, you can use the GBT API to get started, but there you can also use other ones. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but things can be uh, that we do manually, like go to Wikipedia and find something, put it into a prompt to get the summary, or go to Google, get the latest results on a particular subject to find the current facts, put that into a prompt and get an answer, uh, talk to my own database. Uh, all that stuff becomes a lot easier when you're using a framework like Langchain and Llama Index. And having some software engineering background, you'll understand the dependencies that you need to manage to be able to do this, to bring up the different services. Um, and you know, I would say that uh, anybody that's um, familiar with making a simple full stack app, you should be able to do this. You're just adding another tool in your toolkit. Uh, tons of videos and documentation are already out there for uh, Llama Index and Langchain. There's also discords that I jo I've joined lots of different ones and people are always asking questions. They have their own chat box inside the discords where you can ask questions. Um, in fact, you know, it, it is an example of people making a bot with their own data. Uh, when you ask one of these Discord bots for, let's say, how do I do this in Langchain? It gives you an answer. Well, it knows because it has done its own uh, ingestion of the Langchain docs. That's the reason it's able to do that. And when you, uh, so level eight is really um, using it to go beyond just making an app, but really making things that are backed by uh, your own data. And to, to, to do one level beyond level seven, what we want to do is use things like a vector database uh, where we add our own information. Uh, I wrote a blog post about, you know, how do you use your core data engineering knowledge to, to use vector databases? Uh, in this level eight, I wouldn't say you have to be an expert at vector databases because Langchain and Llama Index, you just put your key or let's say Pinecone or Weaviate, and it just kind of does it. You don't have to really understand what's happening. It's just, it's kind of doing it for you. Um, and you can, you know, expose your APIs. If you're using Gitpod, you can host your API and let other people use it. <clears throat> Levels nine and 10 is where having some deep data engineering knowledge is going to be helpful to you. And the reason is that we're talking about um, taking massive amounts of information and using batch processing uh, or parallel processing to get that somewhere so it's in a useful uh, format for us to be able to get and send that information to the GPT API. Um, it's a little bit more than basic software engineering in that we, when we build systems that need to get data updated all the time, um, that need to expose APIs and connect to other APIs and it just needs to be up and running, that's where we go from just running a piece of software that talks to a database to having a piece of software that talks to a database or multiple databases, and then having another piece of software, the data ops, the data engineering code that is continuously updating and processing information in the background. Now, here's where we'll use things like basic relational databases, NoSQL databases, uh, search indexes, vector databases. You may look into using a graph database. Um, and, and that all that knowledge comes with a background in data engineering. And again, I'm using Langchain and Llama Index because those are the, the most useful tools that are out there. There's lots of people using it. Uh, there, are, there are other ones that are coming out like AutoGPT, which you don't have as much control over. That's a different conversation. Um, but when you take that, idea of the workflow, meaning different steps that need to be done in concert between people and humans, or just, sorry, between people and robots, or just between different automations, that's when we start to think about it as a workflow. And there are tools in the data engineering world that we use all the time that help us run those complex workflows. So Airflow is one we use a lot. There's a lot of code examples. Uh, Daxter is another one. Prefect is another one. And it, these work with Python, uh, not exclusively, because you can have these tools run other code written in other programming languages. But if you use Python, Airflow, you can just take your Langchain workflow and put it into Airflow. 
Um, or there's actually a good example of a Dagster being used to use the Llama index to get data into a vector database. Uh, vector databases are different than normal databases. They they work on um, taking what the words are, and you don't necessarily, uh, depending on which, which vector database uh, you use, you have to either embed it with these numbers, these vectors that represent the words, um, and put that into the database, or the vector database already has that kind of built in, and you have to give them your OpenAI key, and that's how it does it. Um, but because of limits in GPT, you can't just put huge amounts of information in the vector database and then expect you know, um, your workflow to just take information out and just send it to ChatGPT. So what people do is they, they chunk the document. If it's a really, really long document, like a 300 page document, just like you couldn't copy and paste it into ChatGPT to, to summarize it for you, um, we would break that apart and we would only send relevant information to ChatGPT to get that answer back. Uh, as before, your workflow is only as good as the people that use it. Your prompts are only as good as the people, uh, you know, response in terms of, hey, this, these actually work, right? And the best way to know if your prompts and your workflows are working is if people are using it and giving you feedback. And as with data engineering, there's always more to learn on how to ingest data, how to retrieve data, how to process, uh, whether you're using Python or Java or Scala, whether you're using Spark, uh, there's, there's always more to learn. <clears throat> And in level 10, you take what I just talked about and use a different LLM. Meaning, so far, I've been recommending just start with GPT, get, get it to work. In fact, that's what most people recommend. Just use GPT, right? Get it to work. And then take a look at the other commercial ones out there, like Flawed, Cohere, uh, and the open ones that are out there, like Stable LLM. Dolly is another one that Databricks released. Uh, for commercial use, Llama is from Facebook, Meta, but it's not use. It's not uh, available for commercial use, only research. Um, but depending on what you're trying to do, uh, just start using those. Now, most of these uh, are already supported in LangChain. So if you're using, you know, Python or TypeScript uh, version of LangChain, you can just switch between them. And what and the reason you're able to switch between them is because they're just API calls. Uh, actually, I'll correct myself. Flawed, Cohere, and GPT are API calls. You don't host them. Table LM, uh, Dolly, uh, and Llama, you may be able to use the Hugging Face registry of models and use their API endpoint. Uh, but if you really want to do something at scale, you, you, you're going to probably download it and run it. And, and Python is the way to talk to these. <clears throat> and what you'll find is that each of them have different outcomes, they're slightly different. They Ones may be better, like flawed instant is very, very fast, but it's not very, very smart. Um, you know, text DaVinci 02 is fast, it's okay, but text DaVinci 03 from GPT is better. And then GPT-4 is even better than that. <clears throat> and the best way to really know the limits of the LLM is to learn the LLM. Uh, you know, how was it built? What were the parameters that were used to train it? What are the strengths? Um, and uh, you know how to operationalize it. Each of them, likely this open source ones, tells you how they were trained and how you could train your own. And that brings me to levels 11 and 12, where finally, if you have a background in AI, machine learning, and data science, you can use it with the world of LLMs. Uh, not that you couldn't use it earlier, it's just that you don't need it. You don't need to be a machine learning engineer. You don't need to be a data scientist to do LLMs up until this point uh, where knowing what neural networks are, knowing what transformers are, not the Marvel transformers, but the technology transformers um, in AI world. Um, you need to know a little bit about how to build clouds, You know, uh, understand why GPUs are important. Um, and you may have to wait hours, days for the model training, right? Or fine tuning. So this is for the patient folks. Uh, it's also for folks that really have a lot of time on their hand. Um, for most businesses, for most people, you don't have to do this. Uh, I'm not telling you not to do it because I don't want you to succeed. I just think you could get a lot of mileage 
not doing this. And actually, you know, people have concerns about, you know, security. Amazon released something called Amazon Bedrock, which is their version of a large language model that you can host in your VPC on Amazon. Or OpenAI uh, has one called Azure OpenAI, which it runs on a computer in your VPC in the cloud, and it doesn't send data to OpenAI, right? So if people have concerns about security, that's all kind of managed at this point, right? And actually, uh, Amazon Bedrock not only allows you to use uh, their LLM, it allows you to use stable LLM. It allows you to use Claude. So they're actually allowing, giving you more options, right? Anyways, now I've told you why you shouldn't do it. Let's walk through what you can do if you decide to do this. Um, level 11 is taking the current models that are there and using your data of question and answer or whatever and fine tuning it for your domain area. Okay, now there's fine tuning that I'm talking about here. It involves retraining a model. Okay, and there's some shortcuts, but it's, it's actually doing it with data plus some machine learning. There's another type of fine tuning called retrieval augmentation, which is what we were talking about earlier uh, with Langchain and Llama Index. Um, and it actually gets you pretty good results, right? So again, what you're trying to do here, you can likely do it without training your own model or fine tuning your own model. That being said, uh, Alpaca and Vicuna are uh, open models. There's always more coming out. These are based on the meta um, Llama model. And the way they made it uh, so good is they took the output of OpenAI's GPT-4 as a data set because they knew it was good. And then they fine-tuned Llama's model, which was already a decent large language model. And the output is something like Alpaca or Vukuda, which is like 90% as good as GPT-4, right? Uh, there's another one called GPT-4, all um, that is, you can use it commercially because it's not based on the Llama model. Alpaca and Vicuna are based on Llama, so you can only use it for research purposes. Um, you can compare them with GPT Cloud or Cohere, which were the publicly available ones. Um, and, it, and, and by the way, there's ways to use both. Uh, for example, you can take the output of your fine-tuned model, send it to GPT to get a double check of the quality of the output. So that's also an option. But the reason you're going to do this is for better accuracy and maybe save money if you're making a lot of calls to these other APIs. But there is a there is a break even point where it, it, like it doesn't make sense until you're at that level, right? Um, using an OpenAI generated data set is is a great shortcut. So let's say you wanted to fine tune your model for like bioscience or fine tune your model for um, you know, market research, you can basically using the other methods earlier, create 10,000 questions and answers from OpenAI, double check it to make sure they're good, and then fine tune your model. <clears throat> and the only way you're going to know if your model is good is if you have your users test it and give you feedback. And level 12, building your own LM model with your own training data set. Caution, this is probably not worth it. Um, the, the foundations for learning how to do this are out there on open source, on YouTube videos. Um, uh, in fact, last week I uh, heard a talk by the folks at REPL.it. They have their own large language model uh, because they need to save money because it's getting costly for people to use their tool to create code. Um, so they made their own, okay? Um, there's tons of different parameters that could go into your model. Um, there are existing data sets so that you don't have to go crawl the internet. So the common crawl is the whole internet gets crawled every, I don't know how often. C4 is the cleaned version of the common call internet data. The pile is kind of a pile of data that is already kind of optimized for large language model training. Um, and then, you know, once you have your model, you can use it just like GPT, uh, just like any of the fine-tuned models, uh, and get feedback. And um, I'll leave you guys with this. You know, GPT was trained, or all of OpenAI stuff, like it, it costs millions of dollars to train it. 
okay? Um, like $50,000 is chum chain. I'm talking about $50 million, right? Now, fine tuning a model doesn't cost that much. Fine tuning a model could cost you $500 of compute time. But training your own model is a, a lot of money. And that's not the bottleneck. You can always get more computers, right? You can add all, you can always add more layers to the neural network to make it better. In fact, that's what people do. They don't really, there's no special sauce. They just keep adding more and more layers to the neural network and it gets better. Um, the bottleneck I, I learned is not any of that, compute or money, it's the data. There's just not enough data to make the large language model even better. There's just not enough data on the internet, if you can imagine that. So if you wanna do it, go for it. Nobody's gonna stop you, but you might wanna solve the problem of how do we get more data? And key takeaways from prompt engineering roadmap is this, right? A lot of people have already done what you're maybe trying to do. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? See what people have done in the low code, the no code world. Use frameworks like um, you know Langchain and, and Llama Index because they're already going. Uh, there's a lot of support behind it. They already have a lot of connectors. Um, know where you are. You may be in the low code stage right now and that's completely okay you may not even be ready to program but that's okay too you can just start by using chat gpt and learning how to prompt better that itself is a huge skill being able to prompt whisper <laughs> uh you know chat gpt whisperer uh, maybe a job title soon uh is a huge skill um you know the the better you are at it the more outcome you will have with work you do. And eventually you can teach other people how to do it or to operationalize it with no code or low code. Um, I put this line, let's do this step-by-step. Step, and that's the reason why I have it like, you know, 11 levels. Um, but this is actually a key word that people use in prompt engineering. And there's academic papers about this. You can trick GPT to do better math, to solve more difficult problems just by adding this to your prompt. And what that forces GPT to do is not just complete your text from what you gave it, it actually makes it break down the problem and then do it step by step. So you can do the same thing. Um, map out what you wanna do. Uh, I've told this to so many people that are trying to start to learn something new. What's your goal? What are you trying to do? I think it's great to start experimenting, learning the tools, but eventually if you really want it to stick, you gotta have a goal. So. I had a goal of building a chatbot. So I built it with Bubble and, and, and ChatGPT API and an Astro database. I had a goal of creating a thousand blog posts. So I tried it out with Make and Airtable and OpenAI, learned that it was gonna to take too long. So then I picked up my dusty Python toolkit, had GitHub Copilot help me, learn how to debug issues with ChatGPT. Uh, but I had a particular goal in mind and that's what I would recommend. Have a particular goal in mind or what you're trying to do. And lastly, work with your strengths and the strength of others. And what I mean by that is you may have certain skills. Other people may have other skills. GPC has other skills. Don't feel afraid to ask other people for help or for their input or, or GPT for that matter. Um, but you heard me talk about workflows, right? And if you're a great prompt engineer and if you're a great programmer, you may not necessarily be a great business process optimizer or a business analyst. They may already know what the goal is from a challenge perspective, right? And they can tell you what they're trying to solve and you can take that and then you can solve it. That's all I have for today. Um, thank you and dream big. Uh, you can check out, uh, I should also put on here the Kono.io uh, blog where I'm kind of blogging as I go along uh, this journey of LLM. Um, you can hire us to help you out with some of this stuff. And there's tons of videos, including this series on YouTube. Thank you so much. And until next time, have a wonderful time.